uh, to this uh, webinar on uh, how we can use data to fight climate change. Uh, my name is uh, Malin Krona. I will help to guide through this webinar. My name is Pierre Mathieu. Uh, I will also be a co-moderator in this panel. Uh, yes, and, and this uh, seminar is uh, hosted by Civic Tech. You can tell a little bit more. About yeah, sure. So yeah, so I'm I'm a member of Civic Tech and one of the co-founders, Civic Tech Sweden. Civic Tech Sweden is a network of people working with Civic Tech in Sweden. So we organize events like this one uh, regularly, both physically and more and more digitally. And we also try to coordinate uh, different projects and organizations that exist in Sweden and work, for example, with open data, with participatory democracy, uh, with transparency, which are the like core themes of civic tech. But because it's such a small ecosystem in Sweden, we are also open to uh, a lot of different projects that can uh, maybe branch out a little bit. And, and we have, for example, some projects that work with uh, climate change or climate data, uh, sometimes connected to open data, but not necessarily. So that's also why we thought it was interesting to organize these uh, climate sessions uh, this, this fall. And we're really happy to, to have put that together. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and this uh, webinar, it's going to, we're going to record it, uh, just so, so you know. And if you want to uh, ask uh, any questions, you can ask your questions in the chat. And we're also, uh, we have a digital um, host, uh, Panilla, uh, who will answer your questions uh, in the chat. And we will also try to uh, see if, if you have any questions to the panelists uh, and also uh, sometimes if someone puts a, a question that is more of a kind of discussion we will ask if you want to, to join the, the discussion we can unmute you uh, but then you have to know that uh, it's all going to be recorded so so just that you know um so uh, we have uh, we have uh, our guests today. It's uh, Clara Kibor, who is a data journalist, and will talk about her project uh, climate data. Uh, Johan Eklöf, uh, who works about with the Climate Secretariatet, the Climate Secretary <laughs> in English, uh, and Olivier Corradi, uh, founder of Tomorrow, who will talk about uh, different projects on. Uh, uh, on how uh, they're using data uh, to, for people to help to uh, reduce their climate footprint. Uh, and um, uh, we, um, we're very happy that you are joining us. And we also want to continue this discussion afterwards uh, because uh, as everybody who are working with data knows, uh, it's important to, we are often quite generous to share data because we know that someone else will find something new, interesting in the data we are working with. So if we can find new networks uh, and uh, me myself, I'm working as a journalist uh, for the magazine Sveriges Natur. Uh, and we have been working with, for example, uh, Clara from Newsworthy, who will soon introduce herself. Uh, and we think that networking and sharing uh, our projects, sharing our data uh, will open up uh, for more new uh, successful projects. So we have, uh, I will share in, in the chat uh, later on. Uh, also, we have started for today a Facebook group if people want to join the discussion afterwards to share good examples but also all uh, obstacles uh, and things if we need help in sharing data sets, etc. So uh, we're looking forward to, to this, uh, for th these uh, hours, but also afterwards, coming weeks, months or years, we can work together and doing interesting things together. So first, uh, let me introduce uh, Clara Kibor. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> She's uh, also here with us. Hello. <laughs> So, um, thank you. Should I, um, you, should I do my presentation? Yes, you can do. You can just uh, introduce yourself a little bit oh, first. Brilliant. Yes. Well, um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, so, yeah, um, I am a data journalist um, currently at uh, Newsworthy, um, and I've been covering uh, climate change is one of the main top topics that I've been uh, covering uh, for a number of years now. So it's really interesting to have this conversation kind of more broadly and uh, to kind of figure out ways, as Malin was saying, that we can can kind of increase collaboration across uh, with more partners. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, yes, so um, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about from a more kind of journalistic perspective. I know we have a couple of kind of different uh, different perspectives here today, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of what I've learned so far about how to um, how to tell better stories and create better journalism uh, with climate data. Um, so first, let me just really quickly introduce Newsworthy and to uh, what we do. Um, so we um, we kind of do we're a very small journalism startup that do um, local data journalism um, and a lot of what we do is kind of how around working with how we can automate that work. Um, so what we do is we use code we use statistical models to um, identify what kind of stands out in a large amount of data. So in other words, what is newsworthy about it? Um, and we turn that into news. Um, so we, we write articles also, as you can see there, also in code um, that are kind of given local angles depending on how the data looks for a certain area. Um, so a lot of what we do is kind of a free subscription service, um, which is mainly aimed at local newsrooms. Um, but we've also been doing increasingly, we've been doing projects together with other partners, as Malin was saying, uh, with Sveriges Natur, we've done a few projects earlier this year. Um, and obviously this year has kind of been very heavily Corona focused as for everyone else. Um, but apart, we have also done quite a few uh, stories around uh, climate and um, it's a topic that, as I was saying, that I have been interested in for, for a long time. And um, <clears throat> I think, I think it's a topic that is obviously it's incredibly important, but it can be quite tricky to approach as a journalist. There are like a couple of hurdles. Um, and I think that one of those is that one something that you discover quite quickly when you uh, when you approach climate from like a data journalism perspective is that there is there's no shortage of climate and weather related data to work with. There's um, but what you do have, it tends to feel very sort of abstract. Um, so we are often told things like, oh, the, the planet has like warmed by 1.2 degrees, things like that. But those, those kind of global averages, those global like temperature anomalies, they don't really mean anything. They're quite difficult to, um, quite difficult to engage with, I think. Um, so I think that once you've done your analysis, you have to kind of take it a couple of steps further and think about how can I present this in a way that's gonna be uh, meaningful and engaging and memorable for the for the reader. Um, so these are kind of a couple of the things that I've learned so far. Um, and first of all, one of the things that we work a lot with is trying to think about ways in which we can make the data that we're presenting more personal and more personally relevant to, to the reader. Um, so this is a great thing about data journalism is that it makes it possible to not just um, not just tell kind of the broader story and not, not just the headline, but also answer the question like, well, you know, what does it look like for you? This is why it's important to you. This is what it looks like where you live. Um, <clears throat> and this is something that we know will make the entire story that you're telling much more memorable to people. Um, so let me give you an example. This is, um, so before I joined Newsworthy, I was working at the BBC and uh, one of the last, um, one of the last projects that I worked on there was this visualization around um, rising temperatures. And the premise was super simple. We basically wanted to answer the question, how much warmer has, uh, how, how much warmer is it since the year 1900 and how much, how much warmer do we think is gonna get in future? Um, so very, very straightforward. The problem is, as I was saying before, is that these kind of global anomalies are uh, very difficult to engage with and quite difficult to, um, to make sense of. Um, so what we, what we tried to do to handle that uh, was that we zoomed in as much as possible on the data. So partly we chose to look at, um, instead of the average over a year, we chose to look at the temperature for a typical summer's day and a typical winter's day. And also we zoomed in on, this, on the city where, where the reader lived. So we partly wanted to make it more geographically relevant, uh, but partly also make it more tangible by, by presenting the temperatures on a, on a given month that you can kind of picture. 
Um, so I guess that would be my my next bit of advice is to try to think about like try to be creative about all the different ways in which you could make your data more tangible and more concrete to the reader. Um, so this is a, a slightly more recent example, something that we at Newsworthy looked at uh, last winter when Sweden was having a very warm winter um, and we started looking at um, how many days of snow we're getting using data from the Swedish Met Office, SMH. Um, so partly looking at observed data, how much snow has there been so far winter by winter, but also what do we think is going to happen in future based on different climate models. Um, and our thinking behind this was kind of that we know that temperatures are rising, um, but we wanted to kind of take that one step further and think about what could be like a more tangible consequence of that. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of thought that looking at the number of actually like wintry snowy days that you're going to have feels more engaging than maybe looking at a small difference in temperature. And again, here we had, uh, we were able to break it down very, very granularly. So again, we were able to give a really local picture. Um, and um, the kind of the goal here is ideally uh, it is that the data that you present, the story that you tell will kind of resonate with a reader who, you know, that it will kind of echo a trend that they have already noticed in their area and that we can kind of give them more insight into, okay, well, what do we think is going to happen uh, next? And the final thing that I want to say, um, which again, this is from like my kind of journalistic perspective, but I, I, I think, and I hope that it's kind of more broadly applicable as well, um, is to kind of think about the, the bigger picture and the kind of uh, the consequences uh, when presenting your stories. So um, here's, this is an example um, from a project that we did together with, uh, with Molin and Sveris Natur um, earlier this spring, when we looked at um, how growing seasons are changing across Sweden. So again, this is with data from, uh, from the Swedish Met Office. And um, we could very quickly see that uh, growing seasons were going to become longer and spring was going to arrive earlier to, especially to the south of Sweden. Um, but we were quite curious about taking that like an, an, another step further to get like a fuller picture of the consequences. Once we Id had identified that the data had this quite strong trend, this big development, um, we were curious to find out what that in turn would lead to, what the sort of consequences of that would be. Um, and it turned out that a direct consequence of the kind of change in growing season was that there would also be many more days of drought, um, which was also something that, as you can see here, was also something that you could measure directly in the data. Um, so kind of taking it that extra, um, trying to always think about what could be like the next step um, to find the sort of the consequences in the bigger picture um, will lead to much better stories, I guess. Um, so yeah, finally, I would just say this, that data on its own, uh, I mean, data is great, but data on its own is quite pointless. So we really need to work to kind of put it, um, to kind of make it tangible for readers and to put it into a bigger context for it to make sense to people. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Clara. Um, so you can, you can, uh, Please, uh, please stay here, stay here <laughs> between us. Uh, yes, uh, and as we said, you can uh, ask your uh, questions in the chat as well. I, I, for first, I have I have a question. Yes. Uh, yes, I have been working with you, and it's really inspiring to to hear you um, speaking as always. But the, I think the challenge that if you make things, the challenge is to make it concrete. But also, if you make it too concrete and too small that people will feel that this is too small when you're the big decisions. Mm. And how, how do you how do you reason, think about that? I totally you agree with you. Thing? I think that is a big problem. I think that you need to balance making it, and is an especially a challenge with climate change because it's such an enormous topic and it is quite difficult to try to get some kind of overview of it. So you do need to kind of try to drill down without losing sight of the kind of the bigger story. Because I agree with you that if you try to drill down a lot, um, like for instance, a lot of um, a lot of coverage of climate data journalism has been around things like the kind of things that individuals can do to bring down their carbon footprints, which is 
which makes sense because it is something that feels quite tangible to individuals, but it also, it's also like a very, very small uh, part of the story, if you know what I mean. Um, so it would be great to, to be able to get something that is more, uh, more bigger picture. Yeah, and let me see. Uh, yeah, we have uh, we have a lot of thank you <laughs> in the chat. I have a question regarding uh, you were talking about making your stories more appealing and more popular. I was wondering actually which kind of metrics or uh, yeah rational they were a bit behind the reductions. Uh, will, for example, like what what are they using as drivers? Are they using the popularity of the articles, or do they also have? their own metrics regarding climate change or regarding uh, awareness to climate change uh, um, internally? That's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, I think that broadly we tried to, we tried to measure engagement rather mm -hmm. than things like simply more simplistic things like views or mm -hmm. so uh, engagement. Yeah. So shares and things along that mate, along that, uh, along those lines. Oh, so, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. You know, so that's always the driver behind uh, the creation of these. Like when, yeah, when you look yeah. at. Yeah. Hmm? Can you please come closer to the microphone? Sorry. Yeah, this is a bit. Uh, it's hard to manage the physical and the digital. Yeah. So <laughs> my, no, but I think you answered my question. Yeah. So the engagement is always the the end driver for journalism to to measure how, yeah, um, how effective these articles are. Um, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And we do have uh, in the chat, I think we will, uh, we, because we will have a discussion later on. So this is a quite interesting topic on this uh, being uh, working as a journalist to present data in a way that is engaging people, but not to be an activist when you're a journalist. But then we also have people working as activists. So, so we, have, we have an interesting example here uh, that we, we will discuss uh, later on, uh, I think, when uh, we have listened to the others. Um, because that's, uh, yeah, that's, I, I will save some of those questions <laughs> later on to, to, to uh, uh, as, a, as a journalist, uh, we're trying to present things in engaging ways, but also to be what you are calling consequence neutral. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, move on to our next uh, uh, panelist. Uh, it's uh, Johan Eklöf, and you can present uh, yourself. Thank you. Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Johan Ekler, and I'm going to start my screen share here. And there we go. Do you see how can data help fight climate change now? Um, so I uh, work with Klimaske Tariotet, who has uh, taken upon ourselves as uh, a mission to uh, relate this information of the, the global challenge to regional levels and instances in municipalities where um, we have uh, discovered that there is a lot of willpower in these municipalities about making uh, an effort, a sincere effort to reduce their emissions, but they don't know how to. They don't even have um, good access to data about the emissions that are happening in their own municipality. And they need guidance in figuring out where it makes sense to make the most efforts. And there's a ton of data available that describes which emissions that happens on a local level. But how do you relate that to the global challenges? And how do you relate the global budget that we have? I'm gonna talk a bit about that and how we do that and opportunities that we see when we do this. But first, I want to recap and do a global outlook here. There's a lot of charts and graphs like this. I'm not gonna go through all the details here. This is from the uh, project called the Global Carbon Project. And they um, present a budget every year, every year where they essentially take the um, uh, carbon budgets uh, declared by IPCC and um, compare it to estimates of emissions in all the countries in the whole world. And uh, you can see that uh, there has been some upwards going trend and uh, right now we're in between 35 and 40 gigaton c2 per year but what does that mean i can't relate to that it's not information that i can act upon i need to relate to it somehow and um, you can see different you can break it down into sectors and you can see trends that goes in different direction this is informative this is something that tells me something about the world but this doesn't tell me anything about say sweden or my municipality within sweden so in order for me 
as uh, official of a municipality to act upon this, I need something else. Um, descriptions about how the relationship in the nature works are also relevant, uh, but still not something I can act upon. And I think you need to compare different data sets and data, data services to uh, nail an understanding. So I've often start with a global outlook like this. And we talk about the, how the um, uh, amount of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has steadily been increasing during the industrialization. And uh, we have an increase in temperature as well. These two graphs are that easy to plot on top of each other. They follow each other really well. And you don't need to go into the statistics. You don't need to analyze too much about um, what's uh, actually the driving factors that this is actually um, not just a spurious correlation. I think talking with people about uh, relationships like this makes it more relatable in the sense that you can understand how different concepts just, you know, not intuitive, but almost intuitive, get a sense of it. And um, here we have uh, on this y-axis over here, two degrees up there. And we started on the pre-industrial period with zero degrees warming. So that's what we're comparing to. Right now we just passed one degree. And the trajectory here is well, clearly rising. And um, then what happens at 1.5 degrees and two degrees? Well, there's a lot of things that are gonna happen, but uh, a lot of people is confident enough and just assume that, okay, well, IPCC says that we should aim for 1.5 degrees. We should probably do that. And then you, you get this picture and see, oh, we are actually pretty close and we're heading in that direction really fast. It's not gonna take long. And uh, how do you stop this kind of trajectory? Um, when um, you ask the question, what does that mean for my region? We have a global economy, we have global warming, but we have local emissions. Emissions happens from tailpipe all over the world. They are local when they happen before they spread. This is a map of the estimated emissions in one of the municipalities in Sweden called New Shopping. And uh, this is publicly avail available data that um, is, um, there's an organization called RUS, of which SMHOI SM is a part of but uh, also Naturvårdsverket and a couple of other institutes in Sweden, they gather all sorts of estimations of emissions and put them together. There's so much data out there. There is uh, about not just the car that drives around, but which uh, different companies that do have different uh, locations and um, what types of activities are going on in the country. So they make these estimations on the, uh, not just carbon emissions, but um, on, I think it's 20 different type of uh, um, chemicals that are emitted to uh, the air or to sea. And uh, carbon is just one of them. And they have these intricate models that just sit there and they are not made as accessible for uh, people. And when they show this to, uh, let's say, niche shopping, for instance, they don't know that there is such estimates even. So they can't act upon it really. And this is, we're not even getting to the picture. So what do we do about global warming? This is still just, so what's even happening right now where we are, we're still in that. And just communicate that and put it in a local perspective like this. It's something I can relate to. I can see, oh, this is actually my road. I live here or something. But when you take the global budget, divide it into regional responsibility, you end up with something like this. This is a paints a dire picture. What this picture so shows us is um, the historic emissions in different sectors. And um, up until 2020, it looks something like this. But uh, if you take a global budget that IPCC have um, given us to stay somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees warming, and uh, you divide it first into um, industrialized countries and non-industrialized countries, and then uh, within the industrialized countries, you give Sweden a proportion, Within Sweden, you give a municipality a proportion. This is what they're left with. Every single dot here represents, in this case, 531 tons, metric tons of emissions. And uh, if you're gonna stay within this budget, this is how fast you need to reduce these emissions. Uh, it's not 
going to be enough to reduce emissions in one of these sectors. Like it's there's no room left over here. It's not enough to just even change the emissions in all of the sectors because the change that is required here is uh, needs a technology shift. It's uh, the only thing that could even go, <laughs> become close of uh, reaching a goal like this. And uh, Nishöping has uh, in recently in the past, I think it was in July, they declared that they have as an official statement that they are going to try to aim for this curve of reducing their emissions by 16% every year. It's like, do they have the authority to even make that happen? Well, no, but they have the authority to support the companies active in their region. And this is the effort that they are striving for. And um, I'm uh, gonna show you what it actually looks like. So for knee shopping, for instance, this is the shield knee shopping. When you look at the historical emissions and you can see what, what could have worked in the past. Every, this is the same number of dots in total. And since the, the reductions didn't happen, you ended up at this point now where it would require a really steep curve to make, fix, make this work. And if you would postpone this just one year, all of these pots, dots that would need be needed to fill up would have to be taken up from somewhere in the future. And um, we also use a um, um, similar idea like uh, News 40 presented about um, regionalizing descriptions in text um, so that um, we can uh, go into one of these sectors and uh, get an understanding of what these numbers here, they come from data and uh, can uh, relate to it in uh, compared to other things. I think I don't think data in and of itself actually tells you anything about the world. You have to relate it to something, to just a number. It's not something that tells you what to do. Um, we have an option here where you can uh, explore what would happen if we don't make any change at all. This budget would run out in 2025. And at that point, niche shopping will have exhausted their share of the global carbon budget. If they would make a reduction like this, yeah, you can redistribute the future emissions like that. Then an interesting thing is that the Swedish official reduction goals is about half what would be required to stay within this um, the regional share of this global budget. And the way how you divide a global budget into regional shares is non-trivial and it's not unambiguous. You can do this in different ways. We choose a stance that we don't make that decision. We refer to other published research who has uh, established models for doing this in, um, well, in an attempt to do a fair distribution between non-industrial countries and industrial countries and um, use a pragmatic approach still while maintaining the um, total of the, all the emissions of the, of the globe. Um, and um, to relate to what this means, okay, so Arbits Machine, what's that sector? What is that about? You can actually look in the map and see, yeah, it's distributed like this in the shopping. And then you can pick something else and see in another sector, you get a different picture. This makes it just having access to this data makes it possible to even start talking about making reductions. But if you don't have access to the data, there's no way for a municipality, especially the smaller ones, to even attempt supporting reductions. So, yeah, we um, are continuously trying to uh, make this tool more accessible and more useful for the municipalities. Something we don't have is um, things like advice and support. So how do I do to reduce the emissions? How do you do that? I wish I could tell you, 
I can tell you that this is required if you're going to stick to the budget. I unfortunately don't have the answer how you're going to make that happen. But I think the picture here is fairly clear that reducing emissions in, in the, old, the old sectors by making more things more efficient is not going to cut it. Just not because of rebound effects, but simply because the reductions required are way too big. So we need something else. But that is all I had. Thank you. You're muted, I think. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can uh, stop sharing uh, your screen, Johan, please. <laughs> and we have had uh, uh, people uh, supporting you here in the chat uh, saying, uh, uh, love the visual visualizations, Johan, very clear. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. You have a lot of thank you and applause. Uh, I have uh, one, uh, one first question. And it's about uh, what you have also, you have also mentioned it, but it's about democracy and uh, accessibility. Uh, mm. The data, uh, as you see, how, how the data, the problems today, there is a lot of data. We do have a lot of data, especially mm. on climate change. It's nothing new. Mm. <laughs> so uh, the democratic aspect of it, the ac accessibility, what would you like to see? Uh, in, in form of, from 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 um, authorities mm. and from also universities in kind of making the data accessible because yes yeah I think I think uh, this is a very cr crucial thing the democratic aspect of it all because uh, in the, the society we live in uh, governments can't just uh, make a decision to make reductions uh, very harshly because they, that would be so unpopular that they wouldn't get reelected and it's not going to work and you're not going to vote for a party that's going to limit your way of living in a very hard way this data is needed to um, create the democratic mandate first in okay. order to uh, but i mean I, I also mean the democratic process just to make the data accessible do you mean that it's unaccessible today because it would be too it requires too much work and too much technical knowledge to mm. use this data mm. and, you and need, for, you, you need things like this uh, correlation between temperature and uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that i show you that's a uh, very like simplified first order approximation, but it drives the home the uh, message. And um, I think mm -hmm. that is a crucial part of uh, making data useful and accessible for a greater audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to understand some of these relationships and trust them. And it doesn't need to be, you need to, I don't think that uh, the individuals need to write it off and just say, yeah, it's some scientist that's something I, I don't understand it, but it's they're probably right. It's not enough. That's not going to be enough to uh, uh, accept the large changes that are required. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that leads us into, I, I will say, if, uh, some, we have had good, some good questions in the chat, and I also have uh, gathered, uh, save, I'm saving some uh, mm -hmm. questions to later on, uh, mm -hmm. on this aspect, how we can yep. use the, the data to uh, democratize. We had, we had a very, very specific question to you also, uh, from Christopher here in the chat, and, and he asked if uh, the municipalities can update the data in, in your tool themselves. No, that's not uh, something that the municipalities do. This uh, data is uh, assembled uh, on a national level in Sweden, and uh, we use the official national emission numbers. Thank you very much. So, so we will uh, have some more questions to you uh, later on. Thank you. Uh, and Thank you. then uh, for uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Olivier Corradi from tomorrow. And uh, you can also introduce yourself, please. Pleased uh, to speak with you all. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I have a presentation here that I prepared. Um, it's gonna be about democratizing climate action. I will try to stick to the 15 minutes you gave me uh, and I have a watch here to make sure that I'm not getting over time, but else just interrupt me if I'm going too much uh, over time. So I think very briefly about myself, I'm, uh, 
originated from France and Denmark. So I've been studying statistics and engineering in, in, in France and in Denmark. I've uh, been at various companies where I worked a lot with data visualization. Founded Tomorrow in 2016, so that's almost five years ago, with the premise that we should put together in the same company people who know about data manipulation, uh, building digital products, and understanding the climate science. And so I'm extremely thrilled to have seen the presentations before because for me, they uh, it, it echoes a lot of the different principles that we also believe in. Um, so I will also come with my share of graphs. I uh, hope you'll bear with me. But for me, this is the biggest challenge of our time, the atmospheric CO2 concentration um, is pretty crazy right now if you look at it on, on huge timescales like you know 40 50 thousand years the only thing i'd say about uh, co2 is that it stays in the atmosphere from centuries to millennial it's basically a, a molecule that is chemically inert um, it only reacts with water it gets absorbed in water with pressure difference and with photosynthesis so therefore um, it's extremely difficult to get rid of and that also means that all the even if we stopped emitting carbon in the atmosphere now and basically the, the warming we're going to see in the next 10 to 20 years um, is already set in stone and that's why it's worrying um, one what does what do we need actually to get to the reduction to get to a two degree path uh, and johan you you mentioned some of these you know numbers and i wanted to put them into perspective with the COVID outbreak that we've had because you have this report from DC, bcg that basically says that if you take the the lockdown we've had on a global scale and you look at the CO2 emissions, if they're smoothed out over the year, you're looking at something that looks like minus five to minus 10% of CO2 reductions. And that's roughly what we need to do every year if we wanted to be on this two degree path. And so this shows a little bit the scale and the magnitude of these things. Um, and you can also see that the current trajectory and the Paris Agreement pledges are of course insufficient. So- you, Olivier, I was just wondering, are you sharing your screen right now? Because we can't see it. See it. Ah, good point. Sorry, yeah, I... you were so like confident. So I was wondering when you were gonna sure start the presentation. You know what? I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. So sorry about that. Uh... I think I think I think you. If you want to see the only graph, the two graphs that matter is this one. I mean, I just I just pause for a second here because you see this spike in 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 CO two emissions that I was referring to just previously. Um, Al Gore did a pretty famous TED talk where he's taking an elevator, you know, to point out this this spike. Actually, yeah, I encourage everyone to look at it. Um, and the second piece about COVID here shows you the evolution of CO2 um, um, emissions, in the, well, greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And you can see here this small bump you're having due to the COVID-19 outbreak uh, with a rebound effect, of course, afterwards. Um, but you can see that if you wanted to follow this two degree path, what it would take. Um, so I think I'll skip that one in the interest of time. But, but the idea with the company tomorrow is to empower people and organizations to you know, understand and reduce their carbon footprint using, <clears throat> using data, sorry. Um, and I'll also skip that one in the, in, the, in the interest of time. So there's two products we've built, um, Electricity Map, which helps us um, understand the carbon footprint of the electricity usage worldwide. And then another product that we're currently building that is called Bloom. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about electricity map because I believe that that's the more interesting product in terms of data visualization. And for those of you who, um, who haven't seen the product, uh, I'll do a very, very brief demo out here. So it's, it's a public tool that you can access online. Um, let's see when it loads. There we go. Um, so the color that you see on the map here showcases uh, how much greenhouse gas would be emitted for every kilowatt hour you were to take out of your uh, power plug at home if, say, you were charging your electric vehicle. Um, so you can see here, we can take the example of Sweden, uh, for example, right now. This is data that has been updated, you know, at, at 227. So this is not too long ago. It's almost real time. Um, you can see here the origin of electricity. So if you were to charge your electric vehicle right now in Sweden, uh, you would emit 44 grams of CO2 for each kilowatt hour you would take out from the electricity plug. This number is calculated by taking into, into account the production mix, which you can see here. Um, it, wouldn't it probably won't surprise you that it's a lot of nuclear and a lot of hydro on aggregates. Interesting piece here is that we're also taking into account the interconnectors to the neighboring countries and those are the small arrows, arrows you can see uh, on the map. So for example, here you can see that the inhabitants of uh, Copenhagen, where I'm currently located, are benefiting from this green arrow. So thank you, Sweden, for sending a little bit more, you know, green, like lower carbon electricity to Denmark compared to, uh, to what we have uh, locally. 
uh, and I'm just looking right now. Actually, the wind is blowing quite a lot in, in, in the eastern part of, of Denmark. And if you're curious, uh, we actually overlaid as well on top of this map um, the wind potential here, which showcases how much the wind is blowing uh, in the Nordics. And you can zoom out if you want to see some more interesting pattern here across uh, the whole of Europe. So this is pretty interesting because the way that that electricity map uh, was built, we'll skip here, is that it's open source. Um, so in the beginning when we constructed this map, only a couple of countries were present and we had uh, some various people that would browse onto the map, see some great countries and tell us, hey, we actually know where there's open data that's available. Uh, we can help you extend the system. So you collect data from a wider range of countries and then you can use your own CO2 engine in order to figure out uh, the origin of electricity, put a carbon intensity on it and then color the map. And I remember having distinctively having a contributor that told me it's, it's so cool to work on this because it feels like take, taking a, a brush and painting over the world and getting all those colors filling up. Um, so this is pretty cool. So in, in those four years, we've had you know more than a thousand contributions this is how we colored most of the map. Um, it's been established as one of the references in order to figure out how, you know, what is the footprint of electricity. And we know it's being used now by ministers and head of states, and we're pretty proud of that fact, especially since it's an open product. And I think this is the key part here is, of course, you need to put data into context. I think the two previous speakers made it absolutely clear, and we also share that. One aspect that I want to emphasize is how you can make sure that, that collaboration happens and that you have a scalable approach. There's no way a couple of people inside our company could have done this by themselves. It was only possible because we had this open source approach where everyone helped us um, develop this. So this is pretty interesting. We compiled on top of that an animation, which I hope you'll be able to see through the, through the video. It showcases the evolution here of both the wind patterns and the carbon intensity of the electricity consumed in various countries as you evolve over time. And you can see some countries like Germany, for example, blinking on a 24 hour almost pattern based on the amount of solar they have. So during the day, it's cleaner, during the night, um, it's dirtier. But you have countries like Spain and Portugal, Ireland sometimes as well. And you can really see them shift so much in color based on the wind patterns on top of it. So it's, of course, it's something all the experts knows, but putting it into perspective in such a visual way, I think makes it extremely appealing. Um, so we, we are also, I'm telling also the story of a company that created a business model, model around you know, open data, which is a pretty interesting story because when we saw this, we basically thought, look, um, if we really want to get the whole world electrified, this, all the electric applications, appliances will need to consume electricity at the time where the country is colored in green and not at the time where the wind, for example, is not blowing and the, the coal power plants are supplying the backup power. Um, so we created this API, which enables anyone to understand in real time what's the footprint of electricity. We sell predictions based on machine learning in the next 24 hour to enable commercial applications to optimize for time of use of the electricity. And we sell the historic data to enable companies to do granular carbon accounting and research institutions to do simulations. So in a nutshell, the free product is the real-time uh, product that you saw just before. And then we have the past and the future available through APIs. And those are parts of it um, which are commercialized in order to make the project grow. So that's a little bit the story here. And I wanted to show two key examples um, that showcase what you can do um, with the data that we have. So what we did is to train an artificial intelligence that tries to understand based on historical patterns, how does the electric system react if you start consuming a little bit more of electricity in a place? So it's a sensitivity analysis. And what this can be used for is to say, if I were to install a wind turbine in say Sweden, when that wind turbine generates electricity because the wind blows, what is the system it replaces? Is it a backup generator, like a gas turbine, for example, which is reduced when the wind turbine produces that electricity? Is it an interconnector to Poland, for example? Thus, it would be, you know, uh, Polish coal that would be reduced. And by looking at the amount that by what type of system you're replacing, you can look at what are the associated emissions to what you're replacing. And you can rank the different countries here according to this metric. And this shows you that, for example, on the left side, you have 
Great Britain, and, and which is stabilizing its system mostly on, on uh, gas, for example, and Poland, which is very coal-based. In those countries, if you install more renewables, like fluctuating renewable, renewables sorry, such as, such as wind power, you will get very, very big CO2 reductions. On the other hand, if you install uh, wind turbines, for example, in a country that already has a lot of low carbon electricity, like Norway, Sweden, and so on, the effects will be reduced. What is interesting in this analysis is that we didn't tell the system anything. We just fed it the data, and then the AI recognized patterns in the past in order to try to estimate how the system reacts and how we're usually stabilizing the system. So I believe that that's fascinating from a standpoint that it helps us direct the investments to the right places to make sure that we're getting the most bang for the buck, you could say, uh, and all this money that's getting injected right now at the European level. When we talk about green growth, I would love to see such systems getting used. Um, the second piece is, is a partnership that we've done with Google uh, on the data center um, across the world. So Google has an interesting case because they're using as you guys know, a lot of electricity, that usage of electricity is somewhat flexible because they're using it to train complicated um, artificial intelligence systems that use a lot of electricity. And whether that training finishes you know, at, at 1 a.m. in the morning or at 5 a.m. in the morning or a bit later doesn't really matter to them. So what they can do is that they can shift the consumption around to make sure it matches the times where the sun is shining or the wind is blowing uh, to make a complicated matter a bit simpler. What is also interesting in their, um, in, in their world is that they have data centers across the world. So they can also shift the jobs geographically. They can actually schedule something at a place where the wind blows um, instead of doing it somewhere else. And that's pretty interesting because you could see this as the cheapest storage system available. Instead of installing batteries, just reschedule it to the place uh, where the wind currently blows, for example. Um, and this is, again, application of open data in the end that goes through our system, is commercialized, put into a prediction system, and then used by the corporate world. Um, and then the last piece of, of, of data I wanted to showcase here, which is the new product we're building, um, is not open data per se, but it still is climate data, but it's personal climate data. It's climate data related to your company. So what we're building now is a tool that helps companies understand what is their carbon footprint automatically and on a very granular level. So what we're doing is that we're connecting, for example, to accounting systems. And by connecting to the accounting systems, we can look at each transaction that's registered there or bills. We can look at where did it come from? What time, what category is it? If it's a flight, where from and where to? And by classifying this data and applying an emission factor to it, in the end, we can make pretty interesting and granular um, dashboards that help companies, first of all, understand you know, where, where does my emission come from? Second, what are the goals we realistically can set beyond you know, just being carbon neutral? And, and then the last piece of it is really, once you get all those insights, is there things you can do that both reduce your carbon um, footprint, but also um, reduces your uh, your um, your bottom line in the end, or reduces in, increases your bottom line, but reduce your costs. That's what I meant. A typical example is on electricity is when electricity is low carbon, it typically also is cheaper. So why not automatically schedule you know your heating systems in your office, for example, based on these things. Um, and one extra piece we're going to come out with pretty soon is the cloud integration that enables you to schedule all your computation tasks and basically to replicate the example that Google is doing, but making it accessible to any tech company that is having a significant part of their footprint being the cloud usage. Um, so this is a little bit the topics I wanted to talk about. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to, uh, to deep dive into more uh, yeah, deeper aspects of, the, of what we're doing. And I think you're, you're muted as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very inspiring. We had a very specific question here. Uh, do you connect your data to Wikidata or Wikipedia numbers? Uh, do we need new Wikidata properties? So it depends on what Wikipedia numbers we're talking about exactly. I assume this could be related to the emission factor numbers that we're citing that come from the IPCC report, which I've published on, on Wikipedia. Um, 
But if if that's the case, I think that opens up the question of where do we, so there's two pieces of data we're using. Um, one piece is data from the electricity system, basically monitoring how much does a wind turbine produce, how much does a coal engine uh, turbine actually consume of coal and so on. The other piece of data we're using is what is the actual footprint of manufacturing a wind turbine, installing it, monitoring it, in the case of nuclear, the nuclear waste, um, recycling and so on. So what's, that's the emission factor. And one piece of the data we get from the electricity providers, um, Statcraft, Statnet, Energinet, uh, RTE in France and so on. The other piece, we're taking it right now from the IPCC, which has done some meta-analysis um, that survey a lot of different scientific studies and publish those numbers. And we're using that as a pretty uncontroversial source, even though we are looking into refining those numbers with experts in the fields, uh, because there are some geographical specificities that would need to be taken into account, um, such as, for example, uh, combined heat and power, uh, especially in Denmark, for example, we have a lot of combined heat and power. And I know you guys have in Sweden as well. So um, I'll, I'll stop here for the question. Okay, After we'll come to details. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Uh, and now we, we have some uh, questions and we've had some questions in the chat and we also have some questions here, we have here for, for all panelists. So if you please step uh, yeah. closer <laughs> uh, and um, I will start with a, a question. You can also come even closer when you're talking later on. Uh, we had a question here in the chat from Eric Wilson. I'm addressing it to all of you three. So please just take a minute each or something like that. Uh, and it's a question on data here from uh, Eric Wilson in the chat. What what data sources do you rely on? Some of you have already told, but you can be more specific. And what data sources would you like to see more of if you could dream? So now you, all three of you have a, a possibility to first tell the, the data you love most and then to dream with the data you miss most. Uh, we can start with you, uh, Johan. Sure. So the data we use for the regional carbon budgets. It's uh, things like population of different countries, uh, which is official data. We have um, also uh, official numbers for the national emissions. Uh, we have um, estimates for global emissions um, from uh, mainly the global carbon project. And when it comes to the regional data, it's uh, mostly from uh, this organization called RUS, which is an collaborative organization between the municipalities and counties in Sweden, uh, together with um, uh, a couple of others. Um, and uh, we have also used a couple of uh, published research on um, emissions from cars in Sweden, uh, where we deviate a bit from uh, those official numbers. Uh, we used, uh, and uh, we also, take um, all the so-called NPTR um, facilities, which uh, is basically large industrial factories. And uh, we deduct them from um, the regional emissions because when you produce electricity for the whole country, it doesn't mean to make sense to uh, put that on a given municipality uh, when the usage is much greater. However, uh, heating is more regional, so a heating power plant gets their emissions uh, attributed to the region around it. And then you have one dream, then one, one data. What data do you have a dream? This data, I would love to see free accessible. Yeah, I would like to see uh, uh, data that connects uh, activities to uh, energy sources. This. Um, connection between them um, that you don't, you're not going to solve this uh, emission problem with transportation by driving less, for instance. Mm. And uh, it needs to, we need a new source of energy for transportation. And uh, if we had more data on the activities that are happening, we could use that and uh, explain that discrepancy and the difference and what that means, because it's not about Everyone should just stay at home and do nothing. <laughs> because like Oliver said it quite good here, we brought up this example with the COVID-19, which has caused a global reduction in emissions. But 
this reduction is probably going to have a rebound effect once this all blows over, it needs to be sustained. And then we need a new COVID next year, which should also be sustained, and the next year, and the next year. And yeah, that's not a viable solution. Thank you very much. And then for you, Clara, your favorite data sources yeah. uh, and your dream data. <laughs> sure. So um, I work, I mean, it, the data sources really depend on the project that we are working on. I think probably this is a good um, good opportunity to kind of plug the, we, uh, Mullen and I started uh, compiling a, a document of a kind of a shared document of um, useful climate data sources a couple of weeks ago, which um, I would love to share the link to and kind of continue building on as a, it's good to get more eyes on that. Um, um, and to kind of make it, you know, the more, the more the merrier. Um, and then in terms of, uh, yeah, I'll share that with you and then you could pass mm -hmm. it on. Uh, in terms of a dream data project. So um, I think a lot of the time, um, a lot of the kind of climate data journalism tends to be around kind of measuring changes and, me and kind of forecast me measuring forecasted changes. Um, what I would really love to see uh, is to kind of uh, be able to, to better kind of quantify solutions um, and to kind of be able to break down what, um, what, to be able to measure the solutions and what effect they will have. Um, and to be able to break that down in a tangible way. I think that would be, um, yeah, that would be fantastic. Mm, thank so you. Can I ask, are you talking about the different types of LCA studies of uh, alternative ways of producing the same product? Yes, exactly. Mm. Thank you. And uh, you will, well, if you have the same question to you, your favorite data and your dream data. Yeah, my favorite data, and that's maybe because I'm a data nerd, but I'm really, really excited by the, the weather data you can find on various online portals. And I know ECM, WEF, and, and, the, and the US, uh, the, the global forecasting system are pretty amazing data sets that give you, you know, global forecast of the whole weather a couple of days in advance, but at a very, very granular geographical scale. I mean, on, you have a world map that is basically giving to you at a half or a quarter of a degree latitude, longitude, and that's what we're using, for example, to visualize the wind patterns you saw on the electricity map. And we also use that in order to make our uh, predictions for what is going to be the carbon intensity of the system in the next few hours, which of course depends a lot on the weather. So we've always been very fascinated by weather data and I'm excited that this is as open as it is right now. Um, in terms of dream data sets, there's a lot of them, but I'd like to bring up one that is often um, ignored because it is private data that sits in companies. And I think I would love to get access uh, to more granular data on how the big cloud players are utilizing their infrastructure in real time. So basically understanding when you're using a server, what actually happens, like how much network do you use, how much, you know, which server is actually solicited. And based on that, if you can make a carbon footprint, that would be, that would have a very, very high impact. But unfortunately, this is private data. Would love to get my hands on it. This is the, the usual question of like, oh, yeah, how much, how many, how many grams of CO2 do, do you have when you send an email to someone, for example, or where, when you watch a YouTube video where we have really poor estimates right now. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great, great uh, answers. Uh, I had a question that's maybe a bit harder, and I think we touched on it from from a few different perspectives. But right now, a lot of the work that's being done on visualizing and and breaking down the data is, is often done with the goal of like nudging citizens or nudging municipalities or companies into acting better by giving them better knowledge. But as we are creating commitments through like the Paris Agreement and through different like, like sub global uh, schemes, uh, we see that maybe we could start having uh, something that looks more like accountability or like commitments that are data driven. So do you see us getting towards that goal uh, of, of really like actually, yeah, like like you're, you're paying, you have a budget and you can't go beyond that. And, and what do you think are the missing steps to go towards that uh, in your different branches? Uh, I don't know. I can go first um, with one angle of this. And uh, I think that the, the recent regulations on um, sustainability reporting is uh, one piece of this puzzle 
uh, where companies are required to report on their sustainability and their work in that area where global warming is one part of the sustainability question. Uh, unfortunately, it's still very, very vague and open for companies to do with this a little bit like how they feel like it. And if they don't feel like it, they don't have to do it very accurately. I think that we should step up the requirements of um, environmental accounting and uh, sustainability accounting to match the requirements on the economic accounting. We need to get a grasp of these externalities that are not captured in normal economic accounting. That's I think it's one part of the puzzle. Clara, do you have any? Yeah, no, I think this is a really interesting question. I'm really interested to hear your answers. I guess this is one of the top areas where our kind of different perspectives are uh, more apparent because coming from a journalistic perspective, you're not really mm. trying to uh, to not to create any kind of specific action, as Malin was kind of saying before. Um, it's more, uh, you're more coming from the perspective of trying to, I guess, make sense of the data, or kind of make sense of the world through data for a wider audience, uh, but not specifically, not specifically kind of influence any specific, uh, any specific mm -hmm. action. I mean, I guess journalism has also that responsibility of keeping governments accountable or yeah. the company. So as also, if you as a journalist are empowered, for example, with the tools you're providing to local journalists mm -hmm. uh, in proving, for example, that a municipality is not doing what they are committing to uh, when it comes to uh, Paris Agreement goals or something, that's also a big power that journalists have to denounce that and to to potentially have an impact uh, even yeah. from their journalist perspective. I think that's a really good point, sir, if I can just expand on that. I think that's a, that's a great point and it's a really, really um, a great power in data journalism that is kind of um, kind of becoming more uh, more important as it's becoming kind of more difficult to access uh, to access those empowered through other measure uh, means to kind of hold them to account through uh, through data instead. So I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. point. Thank you. I see it in Sweden as well, that all the parties now say they want to respect the climate goals. I think this is also happening in France, like no party dares anymore to say we are against like climate, you know, fight against climate change, or, but the way they decide to fight against it is so different and a big part of them, even all of them maybe are not doing enough. So it's also a way to keep the, the fight beyond like asking governments to, to say we want to fight climate change, but actually getting them to do it. Olivier, what's your take on it uh, from your? Yeah, I mean, we so we're in the middle of this, and I think it's a very good question. I think accountability is the thing we're all lacking, as as Johan said. I mean, we we lack accountability both on the government level and on the enterprise level. Um, if you want to get there, data is a necessary condition. Like, obviously, you need to measure and instrument things, but unfortunately, it's not sufficient because the there is a dream of being able to put a sensor in the air and basically be able to have a single source of truth that tells you you're responsible for X, but allocating responsibility is a methodology problem that is not simple. Um, and that gives you ways to manipulate the data, you could say. Um, on electricity, we see that very clearly with two different ways of accounting. I mean, I know at least three ways of accounting for electricity emissions based on the accounting methodology you use. Um, three people can claim uh, to have received the same green electricity, whereas it was only produced once. It's triple counting in principle. And I think that's the key problem that we're seeing is the need to have a methodology that goes across boundaries, um, that creates a consensus on the world about how to do things. You have some initiatives that are trying to get there, uh, both national and international, like the greenhouse gas protocol scopes are trying to get there but at this stage is insufficient. So I see the, the role that I see data play here is that it is a vehicle in order to make sure that once you have the methodology in place that you, know, you measure things properly and then you expose things correctly. Um, but in a sense, it's just uh, any view that restricts itself on data is gonna be is insufficient, unfortunately. So both need to play along um, hand in hand, you could say. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now it's uh, it's uh, three o'clock. <laughs> uh, but we uh, so, so we thank you for all uh, your presentations. Uh, and wait until uh, another half an hour for you who want to to stay and mingle and chat. 
No, no, I mean, we no. have until half past three to for the question in the panel. Uh, okay, sorry, then, then great, yeah, great, great. Minus yes. the conclusion, yes. Yes. and then from half past yes. three to four yes. for uh, staying for those who want to stay and mingle. So we have actually mm. two time for more questions. Sorry, mm. Malin, maybe. Yes, have, So uh, mm. we got some questions yes. that are a bit more specific regarding, uh, I, we have like open source uh, entrepreneurs uh, at Civic Tech Sweden, quite a few of them. So they are always interested in seeing a successful business model. Uh, and so it's more questions like, like, uh, yeah, like that are coming to you, Olivier. Uh, people asking for more details about how you manage to find that balance between having an open source and free and open product and uh, finding a successful business model. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I, I can maybe give a bit of background of how, how the story came about, uh, because in the beginning, everything was completely open sourced, uh, just had a GitHub project and anybody could just copy it. Um, and I think what we realized pretty quickly is that we needed to draw a line between what is open source, like what makes sense to be at the community level and what doesn't make sense. Um, and so there was two pieces to that. There was a piece which was on the code side of things, what makes sense to be open sourced. Um, and then it's on the business model side, like what do you give free to the community and what do you commercialize? And those two things needs to be linked, of course. So the piece in terms of coding that we left open source is the visualization itself, like the front end, and the piece of code that fetches all the data externally. But the piece of it that actually does the complicated carbon modeling, that's closed source. The database as well is closed. Like we collect the data, we show it in real time, but then we keep the data. It's actually something that I'm not super happy about because I want to give even more back to the community. So we are thinking of opening that up under an open data license. Um, and and maybe uh, and, and then there's the there's the AI models that are you know looking at the sensitivity analysis of the system that I showed before and the predictions in the future. So I think if I were to um, sort of indulge in an advice, it, it is to figure out what is something you need to defend um, to your customers and that has value to them, and where do you see yourself giving back to the community because you want to, you know, you're together, you'll be able to go further than, than you are alone. And I think having this split is an interesting piece. So for example, on, on, um, on electricity map, like the, the historical data only interests a few people, like on you know, carbon accountants and so on. But on, on the, on the real-time data, that interests everyone. So that's why it's open. Uh, yes, uh, I see in this, uh, yeah, we have uh, had some questions from Samuel and uh, our digital uh, host, Panila, has asked you, do, do you want to ask your question? Uh, you can you can raise your hands, uh, if, if you, uh, Samuel, if you want to place your question directly. And Sara can unmute you. I'll see ya. Yeah. Hey, is it working? Hey, hey. So, so you can please your question. So I yes. asked two more questions. What question did you think about? Yeah, <laughs> uh, you had uh, a couple of questions here uh, to Olivia, um, uh, about uh, and also to to you one. So you can you can ask your questions. Uh, you, you have put in the chat to, to yeah, specify I them. Yeah, I think. Please. Mm. Thanks. I think the question about open source was a really good answer from Olivia. So thank you for that, and. I think uh, my question to you one is uh, the next one, if I can find it in chat. Um, <laughs> how to, you, you asked uh, about yes, how, yes, yeah. there we have it. So it's a good point about this accounting, like you were talking about nudging and how to use uh, nudging to basically make companies um, use better accounting to disclose more information and take action. but. You've also talked about how to make it enforced, to make it more strict in the future. And how do you think that can happen? I, I think that can happen by putting a cost on externalities. That, that means that uh, if you raise the bar on the requirements for environmental accounting, whatever that happens to mean, but it's right now, it's a fussy area, whereas economic accounting is more specific. And uh, I think you can raise the standards here and uh, require companies to be take the full picture of all their activities and report it according to the greenhouse gas protocol, really. And um, then we can use 
um, put costs on externalities and uh, relate that to basically make it more che a cheaper option to choose uh, another alternative way of doing your activities. And uh, for instance, um, uh, Olivier, Olivier showed a graph of what does it look like when you install a new uh, wind power plant and what are the life cycle and assessment uh, total emissions from doing that, even though the wind power plant itself is uh, carbon neutral while it's running. Uh, there are still other activities related to building it, maintaining it, and tearing it down that are imposing um, emissions. And if we can get those activities as well to be less carbon heavy, well, then you're onto something. And uh, I think we, what we have both spoken about and also how uh, uh, this idea of having alternative life cycle assessment for the same product gives you an opportunity to find these paths, how you can change your uh, businesses. But but really, um, the bottom line and the answer to your question is that I think that externalities needs to be not just visible, that's the first step, but once they're visible, they should also be uh, taxed, basically. So thank you. I have a question on um, on responsibility, <laughs> and it's also connected to to the earlier question on democracy and accessibility, and it's it's to all of us. Uh, I often get the the question from journalist colleagues on what is my responsibility or our magazine, and what is um, and I always say that the responsibility that we have is to go on and do good work and make it comprehensible to people and so on. But what do you think when you think about your responsibility uh, on making uh, on, as I because all, all of us uh, I assume um, listening and participating in this conversation we we do have some knowledge on how to read data or we understand relations and we, we, we but the responsibility we have to to make all this data uh, accessible to, uh, to to everyone. Your your so ha have you been thinking about your? I start with you, Clara. Your responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've kind of touched a little bit on um, what I see as my kind of responsibility coming from the journalism perspective before. So um, it is kind of as you were saying, it is kind of trying to uh, trying to use data in order to make sense of the world. It is using it to hold people to account. And um, in terms of, so I think that you're kind of going into uh, the kind of responsibility that we have when presenting data visualizations, for instance, and how they are read by people. I think that, um, I definitely think about that a lot because I think that um, we know that like data literacy is quite low. And I think, and we know that people tend to um, think of something that is presented in a chart as automatically being kind of unbiased and being this sort of source of truth, which makes it very, uh, very powerful in order to kind of engage and, uh, um, and kind of uh, change people's minds. But it also means that we have, uh, we have a great responsibility, those of us working, you know, in, within data visualization, uh, to kind of think about what we are presenting to people. Um, and to make sure that it is, um, Kind of taken in the correct way i guess yeah and olivier your answer to that yeah i think i think you you made an amazing point actually because uh, when i mean we've seen that um we've had the same experience with electricity map that data has been is prone to misuse there's this very easy example which is the nuclear versus renewable uh debate you know i mean we're coloring the map we, we picked a coloring scheme that says that if you're low carbon, you're green because we're only focusing on carbon. Um, but that is, you know, can be misinterpreted in saying, you know, that, that nuclear is a good thing or that renewable is a good thing or that. So basically we had two, the two camps fighting each other and, and using the map both to their interest, to their interest, yeah. Um, and so we have a responsibility in making sure that we stay as neutral as possible in this debate, be data-driven that the emission factors we're using even though they're actually quite old, they're for 2014, we, we want to update them, but they're still the most accepted data source that enables comparison between both camps, as, you know, in a most uncontroversial fashion from the IPCC, those numbers are. Um, so it, I would completely agree with you. And that's something we try to focus on a lot. And it's a very complicated line to walk if you really want to abide by high standards of 
uh, credibility in what you do. So we have a responsibility to present things in the most transparent aspect to make sure everyone can verify it and can improve it because you you might you will do mistakes um, and so there's a bit of humility that needs to be presented here right thank you i, I like that last line yes <laughs> and also you one a, a, your take yeah. on, on on the responsibility Good yeah job. i can only agree with previous speakers here and um, it's uh, great that we are so aligned and um, the way i would phrase it uh, is that uh, you shouldn't mix things like recommendations with the visualizations and the descriptions. It's two different things. And if you try to do both at the same time, you're prone to adapt the visualization to fit your recommendation. And then you're doing a full, one of the most basic fallacies in statistics where you change your way of analyzing the data based on the outcome. And that just doesn't work. Uh, you need to separate them. And uh, this could be separated uh, not just in how you talk about it. it could be different products different sites different uh, groups of people that focuses on one thing at a time so for instance with the um, climat and the regional bodies that we present we make a very conscious effort here to just display the data as it is the data that we get our hands on and um, we make it relatable we try to we analyze it sure we make it try to make it easy for someone else to analyze it but when it comes to telling someone what to do about it then you're venturing into different territory and it's a different thing altogether mm. thank you very much very, very interesting answers yes. yeah okay. thanks a lot all of you i had a question uh, so at civic tech sweden we often organize events and we often have sometimes hackathons and and we see a lot of people coming from the tech sector people who have tech skills uh, various tech skills, some, uh, often people from university, and they often ask us after the event, so like, yeah, that was great. We actually, I had, I had the feeling I was taking part in something meaningful for the first time since I started working with tech. Uh, how do I follow up and how, how do I get into this world, for example, either civic tech or climate tech or, so what would be, I guess you all have different tech backgrounds or you might, I don't know, you might have a Just journalism journalism from, me, from the yeah. beginning, so yeah. you went the other way. Yeah. But so what would be your recommendation for someone who's looking for a purpose in a, in a tech career uh, to join, uh, yeah, the climate data and climate tech kind of crowd uh, and find their purpose? And, uh, I don't know, Clara, if you want to start on the journalist side. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I would say that um, I would say that I think it's great that this is like an unusually collaborative uh, space. I think like especially in journalism, it tends to be an incredibly uncollaborative space. Typically, um, data journalism is a little bit of an exception. Uh, and I think that we we would do really well to move more in that direction. Like I would really like to see much more collaboration, especially on this topic which is so impossibly broad and quite complex um, that we can all kind of benefit from sharing skills, sharing data sources, sharing kind of um, just sharing our work. Um, so yeah, just. Yes, uh, and yes, and, and that is also, I, I completely agree on that. <laughs> yeah, but, but also that I think, uh, uh, I have to answer part of the question as well, because I think that uh, this understanding data uh, to, to come in to work with other journalists, we, we need a lot of people who can help us uh, on that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, Johan? Yep. Um, so for someone who is interested in this area, there is a ton of things to do. And uh, I, th I think uh, this whole space of um, uh, uh, Civic Tech Sweden is actually a fairly good forum to, to be involved in and I think that's uh, an ex excellent just you, you get uh, exposed to different ideas you, you, if you're interested in this area stick around and the uh, things are they are show they are of interest to you it's going to pop up along the way and uh, there are I don't know a if you already have that motivation and that drive, well, I don't, I don't see any problem. There's tons of things to do, and there are <laughs> people who want to work with you if you have that urge yourself. Thank you, Olivier. Anything to add? I'll, I'll give one recommendation, which is a pretty cool um, community that I've enjoyed being a part of as well, uh, called the Climate Action Tech. I think you can just Google it. They have an open Slack channel. You just join it. Uh, you basically say you're you're interested in doing something and then i can guarantee you a lot of people will reach out with ideas 
Uh, and if you're interested in working with us, it's, it's not more difficult than just join our open Slack channel, come and say hi, or look on GitHub. Um, and actually just searching on GitHub for climate change is, is also a good spar start to, to get a list of projects right going. Um, and also I'm personally very open. So if you want to write to me on Twitter or anything, I'd be happy to point in some directions. But I think the, the, as, as the previous speaker said, the opportunities are not lacking. Uh, so it's a matter of searching a little bit and then uh, don't hesitate to reach out, basically. Thank you. I have a question uh, connected to this one. Uh, and I, before I asked you about your dream data set, now I'm asking you if you had, you have all possibilities, uh, what is your dream data climate project? Uh, and you can now you can dream uh, wildly, and, and perhaps someone is joining you uh, listening to this. Uh, so what, we can start. You, you can uh, start, Olivia. Yeah. So I have this. There's one thing that I would really love, and it's, it's super complicated to do. Um, but I think this there's a vision that I have that one day we'll be able to measure in almost real time emissions from all the countries and attribute responsibility to each of them. And we've seen some initiatives you know, from, from various institutions uh, during the COVID where estimations are, are, are being done, where we can see sort of month over month what is happening. But for me, this is, a, this is the ultimate data set. It's bringing up you know, knowledge in real time for all of industries and being able to figure out um, what's working, what's not, who's on track, who's not. And you can even say, you know, this guy got elected and since he's been in office, then, you know, nothing happened. So it, it's really the ultimate accountability tool for me. You want your dream project? Um, I was very intrigued by uh, this idea earlier about the different LCA projects for the same product. I think that's super interesting to do if that could be uh, made into something that others can build upon on top of, it needs to be a very open source thing. It needs definitely the some way that type of project would ever work. And um, that's, if you could be made accessible for companies to use this in their day-to-day -day business so that they can make decisions based on this, I think we're onto something. <laughs> Thank you. And Clara, your dream project. Oh, oh, there's a lot. Dream big. <laughs> dream big. Um, I mean, first of all, I want to say I've been really inspired by both of the other speakers and the kind of work that they've presented. And I like, I would really, it'd be great to kind of continue and see like what kind of journalistic, what kind of journalistic projects you could use uh, or create based on, based on these kind of tools. Um, and apart from that, I guess, um, so something that you mentioned earlier, Malin, is the kind of that uh, climate data journalism has a tendency to be quite uh, small picture because you, you're kind of trying to keep it as narrow as possible. Um, and the, kind of the idea that it tends to focus on like your kind of individual carbon footprint, something like that. Um, I would love to have a project that was kind of like a larger kind of a, a lar larger scale accountability. Like what are the, um, what are the biggest uh, emitters and kind of get a, a, a greater, a greater sense of accountability, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a good follow-up question. Is like, yeah, what, what, what? I think you partly answered. What, uh, uh, what are you thrilled to work on now that you've seen the others presentation? And what kind of collaborations would you would you see? What kind of things are you curious about the others projects? Uh, Johan, do you want to? Uh... Um, yeah, I've I've seen the electricity map before, but uh, I hadn't known about all the other projects related to it surrounding it. It's uh, not just one thing, it's quite a lot of things you have ongoing there, Oliver. Um, and um, well, I guess the question is basically what I learned from it. And uh, one thing I learned today is uh, that, well, there are even more things ongoing right now, more people striving in the same direction. Uh, and uh, that's uh, overall just a great feeling. I will kind of I knew this, yes, but still more concrete examples always help. <laughs> so, yeah. Olivia, to finish. Uh, yeah, I think I think it would echo absolutely that. It's always great. I mean, we know things are happening, but but sometimes we we kind of need some good news <laughs> in the world we live in. So, no, I'm 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 I was particularly interested in understanding. I mean, you both work in different fields. Like we talk with very different audiences, right? And so I think it's inspiring and interesting to understand what is happening and how you guys are also tackling the subject. Um, 
And I'm, I'm quite sure there's a big interface we should be exploring both on the journalistic side of things and on the regional side of things of how we can make sure this data sort of, you know, continues the story that it has to tell. Um, and I think we should, we should talk a bit more about how this concretely could happen. And I, I mean, on top of my head, I see multiple ways this could happen, but, but maybe, uh, maybe we should take it offline. But however, I, I really echo on the fact that it's great to see that things are happening and that we're getting more and more data-driven stories told out there and that it doesn't become, you know, false, false prone to, a, to become a, a battle of slogans as, as we've seen it happen on, on the other side of the Atlantic, unfortunately. <laughs> so great to hear this. Yeah, so I guess the yeah the next step so we're trying to to set up for this uh, this meetup is to create first a, a channel on our chat which is a bit broken right now so we'll see <laughs> how many can join but we have some rocket chats so it's a bit like a Slack it's not as popular as the ones you named uh, Olivier so I really encourage you also to to reach to to join the global ones and uh, Marlene also started the climate data group so we on Facebook so we we'll see which lives these two, these two arenas have, but the goal is really definitely to continue the conversations there. So we hope to see, to see you there. Um, yeah, and on another point, uh, so we are trying to turn this webinar into a series uh, at Civic Tech Sweden. And the next item in the series that I haven't started to plan would be more about how we get uh, to have democratic debates and discussions as societies regarding uh, the climate yeah, catastrophe kind of a disaster that's impending. And so we will try to touch more about on democratic experiments that are trying to get either uh, legitimacy enough to make to to get populations to accept tough decisions or yet to have uh, to avoid, for example, uh, lobbies or something. So we're trying to invite, for example, some of the people participating in uh, climate citizen assemblies in the UK, in France, uh, or there is also a really interesting Swedish experiment that's called Klimatrigstan, the climate parliament that was also so used to do citizen lobbying towards uh, parliamentarians a couple of years ago, but that is also an interesting perspective on it. So that would be more democracy and climate than data and climate, but I think the two subjects are really, really intertwined. So, uh, so it's really just a continuity of what we're discussing today. Um, and also for for uh, for uh, if you're interested in working on journalistic projects, we have started a cooperation uh, already because we saw as as we are the the largest uh, magazine in Sweden covering uh, environmental issues and the climate change. We wanted to also empower the local journalists with data. Uh, very local data. So that is something we will continue and, and all suggestions on what kind of data we can look into and also other magazines and newspaper journalists, uh, anyone who wants to contribute and to uh, to cooperate and to work together because it's about first we have to like empower <laughs> empower uh, all of all of us working as journalists and also with data with all correct data on climate then we have to empower citizens uh, and then, then we can start talking about accountability. So, so of course, you're also welcome to, to, to contact us if there is anything you want to do. Hmm? Yes, uh, yeah, so I think it's time to close uh, this event now officially. So what we said, it's the first time we have uh, this, but what we said is that we would keep the Zoom room open 30 minutes more for mingling. Uh, there's no pressure to stay for those who have to go into another meeting. But the goal is, is to keep that room open for people who want to keep talking about this and discussing it. Uh, so that's what we happen. But I, I can think I can say that, yeah, the, the, this, this uh, really push, like, yeah, um, really interesting webinar is now closed. Thanks to all of the speakers, Olivier, Johan, uh, Clara, thanks for sharing some of your really interesting work. Uh, yeah, thanks for all the people who came and joined and asked questions. And the, uh, the video will be available on YouTube shortly after. So you will be able, you will, you would get the link if you registered to the webinar, uh, as well as some of the other resources that were mentioned today. Uh, yes, really big thank you to, to all of you who came today. Thank you for organizing. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>